Uh, happy Sunday. My name is Jordan. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Renaissance. Always grateful to have some time to break open the bread of life with you all. So living in New York City, we are flooded with fake things. Sometimes it's really easy to tell that they're fake. If you leave church and go on 25th and see a sidewalk covered with Louis bags, there's a good chance that they're fake. It's really easy to spot. Nobody at Gucci or Louis Vuitton would supply someone with a dozen of their finest bags just to be laid out on a sidewalk. Other times, though, there are fake things in our life that are really difficult to discern whether or not they're real or they're fake. This past week, uh, I watched a documentary on Netflix called Made You Look, a true story about fake art. And uh, it's a documentary about an art gallery that over the course of a 10-year period sold over 60 paintings for over $80 million that were all fake. Now, instead of these artists, uh, these pieces of art being made by some famous dead painter, they were made by some math professor in Queens. Now, these were not obvious forgeries. They were really hard to tell that they were fake because they were being sold by the oldest and most trusted art gallery in New York City, the Nodler Gallery. This gallery had been around for 165 years, predating the Civil War and all of the New York City's uh, museums. Now, even more, one of the paintings that was sold to a collector was sold by um, this gallery, and the son of the artist came in to look at the painting and said, wow, this is such a beautiful painting. And the son of the artist went on record to talk about how beautiful it was. Even this artist's own son believed that it was real. Now, one of the reviewers of the documentary said something that was really profound and it caught my attention. He said, there is a spectacular contradiction at the heart of art forgery. Forgeries, which pretend to be paintings by timeless artists, hang in museums all over the world. There are more of them than anyone knows, all hiding in plain sight. Sometimes we later discover that the most displayed pieces of art were, in fact, the greatest frauds. You know, Jesus had a problem with fake things. Not necessarily fake gold chains or fake Louis bags, no shade if you got one of those, but fake people. People pretending to have a spiritual life, but they didn't. And one of the great dangers of everybody who claims to be a Christian or everybody who wants to pursue God in any relationship with him is that we would develop a forgery of a relationship with God. You know, the most prominently displayed religious figures of Jesus' day were this group of people called the Pharisees. And Jesus routinely had such problems with the Pharisees, not because they were doing mean and bad things, but because they were presenting a superficial spiritual life, and they were pretending to be something that Jesus knew they were not. Jesus would call them whitewashed tombs, that on the outside, they looked beautiful and pristine, but they were dead on the inside. And so Jesus, um, when he talks about our spiritual life, here's one thing he says. Whenever you pray, whenever you engage in the disciplines, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Now, this word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrites. Um, as long as I have my student loans, I still have to use the Greek words every now and then. Um, and when Jesus mentioned the word hypocrite, he wasn't talking about hypocrite the way you and I talk about it today. When I call someone a hypocrite today, I mean they say one thing and do another, right? You say you're a vegan and I caught you at Popeye's. You wanted to meet eating vegans. But in Jesus' day, it was actually much more sinister than, than that. When Jesus would call someone a hypocrite, he was using this word that was common just in theater. He was calling them stage actors. Essentially, a hypocrite in their day 
was someone who wore a mask. So an actor would wear a mask. This wasn't like the modern productions of today, where you have like a full makeup set and wardrobes. One actor could play multiple different roles in the show because they would just switch out the mask on what to perform. And the actor would speak from underneath the mask. And eventually, the Greek word evolved to refer to a hypocrite, a person wearing a figurative mask, pretending to be someone or something on the outside that they are not on the inside, that their life is a perpetual performance. And so Jesus warns us very sternly against our lives being hypocritical, that you and I would be something on the outside, praise the Lord, everybody, and something completely different on, on the inside. And so Jesus, in his day, was well acquainted with people that would wear these masks, They would put on a show. They would be something on the outside that truly wasn't living on them on the inside. And Jesus looked at these religious people of his day, and he said, yo, you know who y'all are like? You are like actors. And so we are starting a series on prayer, and this is a strange way to start the series on prayer, talking about hypocrites. But this is um, the, the section of scripture we're going to read is right before what's commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And before we get into how to pray and the words we should say, Jesus first wants to get at the heart behind prayer. Heaven help us if we learn the words to pray and our hearts are not aligned to the one that we are praying to. Jesus says these words because he wants our life and our prayers to be sincere and genuine. The great goal of the spiritual life is integrity. Integrity means that you are who you are. And you do not pretend to be anything else. You know, we had this foundations class uh, in January, and one of the most refreshing things about the foundations course where there were a lot of people in the class who didn't grow up going to church, so they didn't even know how to be fake. You know what I'm saying? One of the things I love about Renaissance is people invite their friends who have no church background, and they come in the hallway, and they just say anything. So they'll be talking to me as a pastor, and I had this one dude come up to me one, one Sunday, And he said some words that I can't repeat from the pulpit. And people around him were shocked that he was cursing in the hallway to tell me I did a really great job. (laughs) And everybody looked at him like, yo, this guy is really crazy. And, you know, that's not the preferable language to use uh, anywhere. But I respected it. You know why? Because he was honest. I think Jesus respects... Honest, coarse language, more than he respects the, fake, the fakeness that Christians portray on a daily basis. They were outraged because he was using some language that I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend. But Jesus is outraged when we put on a religious performance and our hearts are not aligned to him. So Jesus says, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray, standing in synagogues, on the streets, in the corners to be seen by people. It's a show. They don't mean the words that they're saying. You know, this is why I think Jesus was always radically welcoming children, and why Jesus would say things like, unless you convert and become like a little child, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because little kids say whatever is on their mind. Now with my five-year-old, whenever he starts talking, sometimes we just pick him up and walk away like mid-sentence because I have no idea what he's about to say, because he will say whatever he is thinking, good, bad, or indifferent. And Jesus wants our prayer lives to be sincere, more than polished, more than a, a, a beautiful vocabulary of all the words to say. Jesus wants our, our prayer lives and our inner lives to have integrity. You know, one scripture that I've read over the years that truly haunts me Um, It keeps me aligned. It keeps me on my knees. It keeps me praying to God. It keeps me asking the Holy Spirit to do a work in my life and don't let me drift away because I know this could be me. Matthew 16, Jesus says, you hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said that this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands. 
Now that word in verse 9 is, is such, a, such a profound concept. Jesus says, all of your religious activity, it is in vain. Now what does it mean for something to be in vain? It means no matter how much you do it, it adds nothing to your life. When I was in seminary, um, I got a C in preaching class, which explains a lot. <laughs> I like to think that the reason I got a C was because I didn't hand in my journals. And uh, I was always a procrastinator, and uh, we were supposed to hand in a weekly journal every Friday 10 times in order to get credit for it. And it's about 20% of your grade, these journals. And I waited until the end of semester, I didn't read the syllabus, and I emailed the professor and I said, hey, um, man, see what had happened was, uh, and I, I sent him, I said, hey, I'm gonna send you my journals later this week, and he says, Jordan, the journals were due every single Friday, and if you were to do all of the journals now, it would be in vain. You can do them, but you're not going to get any credit for them. I thought he was uh, bluffing, so I did the journals anyway, and he still gave me zero points for those joints. <laughs> in vain means you can do it, but it will add zero to you. And Jesus says this, as we think about prayer, as we think about all of the things that we do and the, the practices we engage in, if our hearts are far from him, everything we do is in vain. And so Jesus takes this very, very seriously, and uh, he does not want you wearing a mask. You know, even as we think about our DNA groups and our growth groups launching, you can't be in relationship with anybody who's wearing a mask. You don't even know who they are. One of my hopes for you as our groups launch this semester is that you would go into your group and by God's grace, God would give you the courage to take off your mask. That you would be a person, a full person. You would be honest. You would be open. Now, I know it takes a, lot, a little bit of time to get used to people and uh, to make sure that you could be vulnerable around them, um, but it is truly, truly vital. Now, this doesn't mean to, wear, to be a person with integrity, it doesn't mean that you walk out in the hallway after service and just share, if someone says, how are you doing? And you say, I gotta be honest, and just share everything with them, like, I just met you, that's a little weird. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to do this, but in our lives, in our close relationships, in our close relationships, and certainly with God, that we aim to live lives without pretense, without faking. So I have a question for all of us for some self-reflection and evaluation. How much of your life is involved in you wearing a mask. One of my mentors, um, at the end of the day, she would um, come back and she would ask herself this question, how much today was I wearing a mask? That in the conversation I was saying one thing but I actually meant another. That I was going along with the flow even though I felt an objection in my spirit about something. How much of our, your life right now is involved with you wearing a mask? One of the things I heard over this past week was that um, an alarming trend that's happening across the country and presumably across the world is that young people are leaving the church in droves. They're not leaving the church because there's not churches in their area. They're not leaving the church because churches are necessarily closing down. They are leaving the church because young people have a, a phenomenal way of seeing the blatant hypocrisy of Christians in churches. We are in a, inauthentic, and we are unloving. There are so many people who attend church on a weekly basis. They smile in your face, and they're mean. They're just mean people. And people look at us and say, I don't want to be anything like these people. They're miserable. They claim to serve a God who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. They claim to believe in a savior who has come down and given his all to go onto the cross and to die for sinners, and yet their lives are pure hypocrisy. They'll go to church on a Sunday and they'll raise their hands, they'll lead these prayer things, and they won't have a true abiding relationship with Jesus, and they're leaving the church. And although that's grievous, I don't necessarily blame them. So my hope and my prayer is that we would be a people who live with integrity, that we are who we are, 
that we have an abiding relationship with God that flows from the inside, that pours out to all of our outward activity. And so uh, the portion of scripture we're really going to focus on today, Matthew 6, uh, verses 5 through 8. Jesus says these words, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words, don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. And so I want to park on a couple of different concepts for uh, us that I think the scripture is highlighting about what a thriving prayer life demands. And first and foremost, a prayer life demands sincerity. A prayer life demands sincerity in talking to God. And that was the whole first point that we just talked about. Um, as a brief tangent, uh, one of the reasons why I think people who are going through difficult times and one of the reasons why I think people who are suffering grow in their faith is because when life hurts enough, you develop a prayer life that has no pretense. You know, when I was um, in some of the darkest days of my life, uh, my therapist told me to get a journal and to write down my prayers in my journal. And over the years, I've gone back to read that journal in some of my most painful moments, and those prayers in those moments, they were not some big, deep, eloquent prayers. Sometimes they were two words, please, God. Sometimes the only words that can come out of my mouth were just, God, please, please, God, help. God, I'm drowning. God, I need you. And I think one of, suffering is, is not good in and of itself. One of the good things that difficulty and suffering brings into our life is it actually teaches us how to pray with, in reality. It teaches us to really truly pray. And then if you'll let it, if you'll allow it, that type of prayer life will continue with you even after the suffering or that season of suffering has, has ended. And so... Jesus wants our prayer life to be sincere. And really, the, only the gospel can give us this type of sincerity because here's what the gospel tells us. Here's what the gospel is for you and for me. God knows you, the real you. And God chooses to love you. Scripture tells us that we are foreknown, that before the foundation of the world, God knew you. We are foreknown, and then God predestines us to live a life conformed to the image of Christ. And those who he has predestined, he has called. Those who he has called, he has justified. He has made us right with him. Those who he has justified, he has glorified us by giving us his Holy Spirit. And so it is not that God doesn't know who you are. God is not surprised by anything about you. There's not one time where you will go to pray and God is like, yo, that's crazy. I didn't know she was dealing with that. And here's the good news of the gospel. God knows you and he chooses to love you. Grace will meet you exactly where you are. It won't keep you where you are. But grace will meet you exactly where you are. One of my favorite scriptures is uh, from Deuteronomy where it says these words. And if from there you search for him, you will find him. Where is your there? Your there is exactly where you are right now. And if from there, from the place of being disappointed with your life, disappointed with your consistency or lack of consistency, wherever you are, unaware of what the next step is, grace will meet you right there. One of the problems and the challenges that we have is when we are aware of our shortcomings, of our failures, of our sins in our life, the knee-jerk reaction is the feeling of shame. Something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with me. Brene Brown defines shame as this intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And so shame will make you pray fake prayers. 
Shame will make you pretend like you are not who you are, like you're not broken, like you don't have flaws, like you don't have sins. The gospel says you can come to God exactly as you are, and God will meet you right there. You know, one of the stories that I'm reading through right now that has been so profound for me is Jesus calling his 12 disciples, and one of the disciples he calls is a man named Levi. Levi was a tax collector, and for those who are unfamiliar with the biblical landscape, tax collectors in that day were the most hated people. They were traitors. They were stealing, for their own money to get, stealing from their own people to give it to the Roman uh, empire, empire, and they were oftentimes stealing extra money to pad their own pockets. Jesus goes to the most hated person doing the most hated thing, Levi, who was sitting at his tax collecting booth, collecting taxes, and walks to this man and says, Levi, follow me. The invitation from Jesus is radical, and it will meet you exactly where you are. So you do not have to pretend to be somewhere else. You can come to God exactly where you are. Second thing that prayer demands, a prayer life demands, is solitude. Solitude. So Jesus says in verse 5 again, whenever you pray, um, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. So when Jesus is talking about prayer in Matthew 6, he contrasts these two concepts, that there's this group of people who are praying outside for show versus people who are praying in their private prayer closet. And the group of hypocrites are a group of people who are praying public prayers, but they don't have a private prayer life. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying in public. Praying in public is something that the church has done and is a a good gift for us. Public prayer is a good thing. Public prayer is a bad thing when people engage in it and lead it, and they don't have a private prayer life. And Jesus was um, not condemning public prayer, but rather he was saying in verse 6, but when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who is seized in secret will reward you. And so what Jesus is calling us all to do is to make space for him in our lives so that we could have rhythms of solitude. What do I mean by that? I'm not saying everybody in this room needs an hour a day to sit in solitude to Jesus. But if we seek to have a thriving prayer life with him, the measure of our spiritual maturity will not be in your gifts or your abilities, but rather your private prayer room. Jesus says these other words in verse 7, and when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. And also, Jesus is uncomplicating prayer for us in your solitude. He's saying, when you pray, you don't need to go to a private prayer room and say, oh God, from Abraham, from everlasting to everlasting, you who were and is and is to come. God, today we come and we come before you, O most holy righteous Father. Jesus says, don't pray like that. They think they're going to be heard because of their many words. If you come to God, God wants you coming to him with a sincere heart. But make no mistake about it, it is a a tragedy that so many of us would call ourselves, and myself included, we call ourselves followers of Jesus, And our private prayer life is something that is so missing. We give it so little attention. But yet, we would give so much attention to those things which are public and performative. Jesus wants us to switch those two things around. I I used to read this book once a year, a book by a man named Leonard Ravenhill. It's called Why Revival Tarries. I read it every now and then whenever I need a kick in the pants. And um, he said this quote in this book that has, again, haunted me for years in the best of ways. He says this, poverty stricken as the church is today in many things, she is most stricken here in the place of private prayer. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors, many writers, but few fighters, 
Failing here, we fail everywhere. Now, Jesus tells us that if we engage with God uh, in a life of committing ourselves to rhythms of solitude where we intentionally carve out the space, we will get a reward. Twice in the scripture, Jesus mentions this concept of, of a reward. And it's not that if you pray, Jesus is like, all right, how long did he pray? Here's your lollipop. Uh, it's not that it's, a, it's, a tra- it's not a transaction. What Jesus is basically saying is this, and this is also letting us know and clarifying the gospel a little bit. The private prayer room is a place where we go to get God. Not necessarily to get things, although God is not opposed to you praying for, for things. But you cannot have a life in a rhythm where the only part of your prayer life is just asking God to do stuff. And so Jesus is wanting us to cultivate this prayer life with him in which our reward is God himself. And when we go and create those spaces, God will see that we are hungry for him and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Last thing that we would need for that a prayer life demands is assurance. Assurance. Right? Assurance is knowing. Assurance is confidence. And here's what Jesus says in verse 8. Don't be like them, talking about the hypocrites and, the, and, the, and the, those who are babbling. Because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. So here's what God is telling us. Here's what Jesus is telling us. Prayer is not a thing where you have to introduce to God all the stuff that's in your life. God is fully aware. And what Jesus is telling us about the Father is this, that when we go and we pray, uh, we could be confident and have assurance that our God is sovereign. Our God is in control. Our God is all-powerful. Our God is all-knowing. Now, this is not so that you would stop praying, but that you would pray with more confidence and more assurance. One of my friends, John Amacheco, says this, whenever we see scripture define or point out God's sovereignty, that God is all-powerful, it's meant to limit our anxiety, not our activity. So whenever you see things in scripture that says that God already knows what you need, like, so why should I pray? Because God is inviting us into a rhythm to abide and to live our lives alongside him. And so Jesus does not leave us to guess how to pray. Once he kind of first sets things in order about the rhythm and the heart posture of one who is sincere in our prayer lives, one who carves out time in their life for solitude and space with God, Jesus therefore gives us instructions, and we'll be going through these for the next seven weeks. Therefore, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This week, I want you to spend some time every single day carving out some time in your space to pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. One big recommendation I have is we'll be going through it line by line to really unpack it, but just to spend some time going through it line by line and creating some space and solitude to see what comes to you when you're praying. So you'll say, Our Father in heaven, and maybe pause there for a second just to reflect on the words that you just prayed. And then you can go on to the next line and to the next line. And one of my big recommendations is that actually you would print it out and have it in front of you. So you would sit down at a desk or have it in your Bible and that you would spend some time, line by line, going through it slowly, creating space. Here's why this is so important. God wants a real relationship with you, not a fake one. The reason that Jesus is so outraged by fakeness is because he is the one who wants a real one with us. Our God left heaven, came down to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to show us the way because he wants a real relationship with us. And as we follow him with sincerity and solitude and assurance, we will have just that. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we come to you this week and we come to you today, um, Lord, I I pray that we be people who 
slowly and sh but surely learn what it means to follow you with sincerity and that we would be people growing in a genuine faith with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.